In 1998, Michael Cunningham's book, The Hours, was hailed as a literary achievement of major importance. It won the Pulitzer Prize and the Penn Faulkner Award. Then came the task of adapting the story for film. The producers called on David Hare to write the screenplay and Stephen Daldry to direct. Well known in the theater world, Daldry had only directed one other feature film before, the much heralded Billy Elliot. But the collaboration paid off. The Hours has already been declared the film of the year by the National Board of Review and won for best film at the Golden Globes Awards. I'm pleased to welcome Stephen Daldry here to this program uh, for the first time. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's really great to have you here because this is a, I, uh, this is, I'm the last person in line to tell you this is a stunning achievement. Oh, uh, well, thank you. But before you got there, my understanding is that um, Nicole, Nicole and Merle uh, and the extraordinary Miss Moore were already on board. Yeah, Scott had some quite strong ideas about who should be in it, although we did carry on discussing. I don't think they were actually contracted at that point. I think it was just ideas, and then we carried on with exploring the supporting cast. Um, and we were very lucky right the way down the line. But I think mostly it's a testament to David Hare's extraordinary screenplay that we got pretty much first choices right the way through. What did you like about the screenplay and the adaptation of the film? I read the screenplay first, um, and the book pretty much on the same day, I, I hasten to add. And I was reading a lot of scripts at that time. Um, the worrying thing about all the scripts I was reading is they all reminded me of another film. You know, they, 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 well, this one feels a bit like, and oh, that one's sort of <laughs> yes, like that. Right, and, right. Um, and so many films are like other films, indeed. Yeah. But um, this one didn't feel like anything else I'd ever read. It, it felt it, unique. It, it, it didn't look like anything else I'd ever seen, by the way. But it, felt, it feels almost out of genre. And I yeah. love the idea that it, 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 you can't pigeonhole it. It's not something that you can say, oh, well, it's this sort of pick. Um, people try, but I think on the whole they fail. You and David had collaborated before. We did um, Via Dolorosa. In fact, yeah. David came on this very program to talk about Via Dolorosa. <laughs> That's exactly and right. did a rather fantastic interview, I thought. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, so, yes, and he, I'd asked David to go to Israel to actually write a play about the British Mandate period, but he came back saying, I'd just like to talk about the um, Palestinian-Israeli conflict, and so we, he did this one-man show that we then did in London and brought here. Maybe we should have Via Dolorosa 2 now. Yes, indeed. And, Perhaps we need it, yeah. Um, so did that make a difference? I mean, did, in other words, that David had written it, you and David are in sync on things, and... David is a fantastic collaborator, and probably because we know each other so well and we're very close with each other, that sort of helped our process, because the, the way the film was going to be made was that the three segments were very separated. In other words, the women would never meet. Um, and this was not really a film that was ever created in the in the edit room, we needed to know an awful lot about the structure and an awful lot about the emotional, thematic, and, and obviously narrative construction and arcs before we even started shooting. So in that sense, we did work very closely with Scott Rudin, the producer, to um, create a very tight shooting script before we turned over. Was it, most people, if approached to adapt this film, not having seen David Hare's screenplay, where he'd done monumental work, would say, I, I don't know how to do this, as good as I might be. It seems an overwhelming challenge. There's no question there, but uh, do you agree with that or not? David Cronenberg says, doesn't he, that actually all books are impossible <laughs> um, to make <laughs> yes. into films. And, um, and it's impossible to be faithful. And so you have to be faithful to the spirit and the intent rather than necessarily to the detail. The thing that... Uh, David always felt, and I couldn't agree with him more, is that there was in, built into Michael's book was a fantastic dramatic mechanism. And the simple mechanism is that you have a woman, Virginia Woolf, writing Mrs. Dalloway in the 20s, and a, a woman, um, played by Julianne Moore, Laura Brown, reading the same book in the 50s in, in Los Angeles, and a woman in contemporary New York now, played by Meryl Streep, whose nickname is Mrs. Dalloway. Right. So the audience all the time is trying to work out, well, what is the connection between these three women? And again, not just the um, emotional or thematic connection, but what's the, what's the simple, direct narrative connection? Mm -hmm. And when those connections start to be made, it always felt to us there was this huge dramatic rush to the, to the story, and indeed there would be to the film. Okay, but tell me what you mean by that. What is the, what is the narrative connection? I mean, the connection is the book. I mean, the connection is... I know, when the the connection is they're asking the same question, aren't they? Well, then they start turning up in each other's stories. Yeah. 
Um, so that literally, once you start getting that, once you start to realise, I don't want to give the story away for those who haven't seen exactly. it. Exactly. Um, yeah. But when you start realising... Well, on the other hand, we want those who don't know anything about the book to understand why this is a compelling story. I think it works as a sort of thriller. I think that the, the audience is constantly trying to make those connections, and then we do make the connection, then the story makes the connections. Um, and in that sense, I think it works primarily as a sort of as a thriller. Okay, what was the biggest challenge for you? A good screenplay, <laughs> terrific actresses. The biggest challenge, I think, for any director in any piece of um, material, actually, is to make sure everyone's in the same film. And it's also true of theatre, in fact. Um, now, tell me what that means. Well, you can see fantastic pieces of theatre, and, and you know, Senso is brilliant, and the other person is brilliant, but they're not actually in the same production. <laughs> That's right. Um, You're not inhabiting the same place. Yeah, not in the same world. <laughs> and it's also true in the films. You know, I find you know you can watch a film and think, God, they're, you know, they're so brilliant, and and so is the other actor, but they don't seem to be talking to each other, and I don't quite understand what world they're in. So making sure, especially as we were filming so separately, making sure that everybody was actually in the same film, and of course a complication because there is a, in the sense it. it you should sort of feel that it's almost one story and one woman we're talking about and and that the making sure that the emotional arcs were incredibly well um, articulated between one story and another given the fact that we're going to cut very acutely at times between the three stories I've often quoted Mike Nichols on this program as saying that what he expects from certainly actresses and actors is to be surprised he wants them to surprise him because he knows what's in the script, and they know what's in the script, surprise him. Beyond the performances, what surprised you about the hours? I think what is a delight in the hours, um, well, surprising me now, yeah. is I'm, on, I'm, I'm going around, basically going around America and beginning to go around the world listening to audiences talk about it. Um, and I find it one of the most enjoyable and startling and surprising and brilliant parts of of this particular process of making a film is listening to how diverse people's responses to the film are. People say, oh, what's the film about? You know, as if, as if your film's meant to be about one thing. Yes. The idea that this film is about many things and people have a very subjective response to it and so people um, get very distressed watching it or people... Um, where that distress is within the film, it does vary. But the real joy and the surprise at the moment is, is not just how well it's going down, which is always a surprise, to be honest, um, around the country, um, how positive people are feeling about it. In other words, coming out, of the coming out of the film, feeling incredibly empowered. The look that Nicole takes on to be Virginia Woolf. And it came out of, um, it came out of an experiment, actually, where we were testing and exploring and rehearsing. And it just seemed, on the day, it, was, it was just seemed like a good idea at the time. And it certainly seemed to release Nicole. It's you mean the nose prosthetic too? Yeah. But I think that just to talk about the nose as, as, as the single part of the transformation is not quite fair because she does this extraordinary transformation. And for me, the most extraordinary thing is her voice, which is entirely different. Yeah. It's an incredibly deep, unknown voice that we haven't heard before comes out. So it, it really was part of, a, part of a process. But yes, people do not, on the whole, recognize her. They and, don't. And the person I watched it with said, who is that actress? Yeah. Which is fantastic for her because, you know, she is a transforming actress. Um, and certainly the first time I saw her was actually in Sam Mendes' production of um, The Blue Room in London, David Hare's play. On stage, yeah. On stage. And she was phenomenal in that and really did play a variety of totally different characters. Um, and that really convinced me that she could really do this and do this rather brilliantly, which indeed she has. Um, boy. That's certainly true. Take a look at this. Also in this scene is, is a, an actor that I like a lot named Stephen Delane, uh, who plays the husband of Virginia Woolf. Here it is. And then it brought you low. If I were thinking clearly. If I were thinking clearly. We brought you to Richmond to give you peace. If I were thinking clearly, Leonard, I would tell you that I wrestle alone in the dark, in the deep dark, and that only I can know. Only I can understand my own condition. All right, let me ask the question that I asked earlier. What, surpri what surprised you about her performance? Well, you can see, I mean, she, this, is a, this is an actress at the, really at the top of her game. I mean, she's, we've seen her do a whole variety of different roles in the past, but it, I, 
It does feel like she's doing something that you genuinely you haven't seen before, that she really is finding her stride. And I think we're going to be constantly surprised by Nicole, not just because she makes incredibly intelligent choices about her material, which she does, um, but also the range that she can find within herself feels dazzling. She has spoken, I know indeed, she's spoken on this program about what helped her um, find her way towards playing Virginia. And maybe there were certain aspects of her own private life that actually helped her in certain ways. But certainly that finding Nicole sustaining emotional, an emotional landscape and literally just sustaining an emotional quality and very dodgy, deep, dark emotions that she could maintain herself in for days on end was genuinely startling. I was actually worried for her. I mean, genuinely worried for her, um, for her well-being. You were? Yeah, it's hard to stay in some of those states for a long period of time. Yeah. I was going to go on to say, and literally worried about her physical well-being as well. I mean, she drowns herself in this film, and I know. she wouldn't have a double. And, and you, how many sh takes did you do for that? We did quite a number That's of takes. That's what I heard. How yeah, many? I can't remember how many. But it was a number of days. It was more days. than 15, and um, it was cold. And it was freezing, and the water quality was not great, and there's yeah. a strong current. Um, and it was me that was you know, asking the frogman to go in and get her out. She was quite happy to stay there and stay under and keep going. But I was genuinely worried about her. Good for you. All right, Meryl Streep, tell me about her and this performance and, and what you liked about Meryl, working with her. Meryl is, well, Meryl is Meryl, of course. She is. Yeah, that's I, about, she, that sums it up. Meryl is time. Meryl. <laughs> Meryl is Meryl. What I, was, I was very lucky with all three actors, because all of them have spent quite a lot of time in the theatre. Um, and the true of most of the supporting cast as well. So there is a shared methodology and a shared approach to exploring a text or how you would work it to rehearse or stage a scene that everybody knew. So in that sense, it made life much easier. Um, Meryl is a consummate um, professional and technician, as well as having this extraordinary intuitive behavioral ability to release and let go. So what we found and what you know, we would stage and then try to surprise each other in terms of how to find moments that could not, were unrepeatable. In other words, we were genuinely um, extraordinary. And Meryl's very good at m making sure that she discovers and rediscovers. It's almost, Meryl will never do the same take, you know. Um, Five takes, all different. Yeah, and she will keep going and keep discovering and keep finding and keep exploring, which so is one of the great, extraordinary, um, <laughs> <laughs> fun things to do. So if I was a director, I'd want to do like 10, 15 takes. Or 15 to 25. Or 15 to 25. <laughs> you just want to keep going. I d there are times when I thought Meryl thought that I was being rude by just going, oh, well, shoot, let's go again. But I, w I mean, it was just genuinely fasc fascinating just to keep working and keep exploring. All right. Uh, take a look at this. This is uh, Meryl, who is playing Clarissa, and she's with Richard, who has played... Um, extraordinarily well by Ed Harris, and he has AIDS, and there's a party being thrown, and he wants to know who is it really for. Here it is. I think I'm only staying alive to satisfy you. Well, so that is what we do. That is what people do. They stay alive for each other. Let me ask you about this, not with these actresses, but there is this idea about actors' tricks. When people talk about that, what do they mean? They mean that they have a box of tricks that are available to them that they use mostly in times of some sort of crisis. But it's, it's something you rely on as an actor. It's things where I, can, I know that'll sort of work, and that's worked before. And I, you know, it's things yeah. you know that you've tried, they're tested, that you bring out at any you know, available moment. Um, and if you go look at their, a series of films, or you can pick them up. Any good director could see them being used, because they'll use them over and over? Or? Mm, not, not every actor will, or, or every actress will. What's, what's fantastic, I think, in this film is that I think you're seeing three actress, actresses doing work which you haven't seen before. I think that's one of the great joys of it, uh, particularly, I mean, obviously Nicole, but particularly Meryl as well. I think it's a Meryl that people... Um, will be astonished by Meryl once again. I mean, one is always astonished by Meryl, but once again you'll see a level of truth and a level of emotional clarity and density, which is still fantastically startling. I couldn't agree more. Okay, Julianne Moore, the extraordinary Miss Moore. Uh, here she is, and, and this is a scene in which uh, John C. Riley plays her husband, 
is trying to get her to go to bed. She is reading the novel uh, and, and having great questions about the life she's living in post-war Los Angeles. Here. I was going to. I was going to stop by. I've had a wonderful day. And I have you to thank. Come to bed, honey. It's an astonishing performance by Julian, and, and what's, what I love is the detail. And again, if you, keep, if you watch it and watch it again, and, and the great thing is that people are watching this film again, um, is that the, the, the extraordinary level of detail about making the very minute, both psychological reactions and psychological choices that this character does to get her to a point where she actually, in the end, does, in fact, leave her family. But it is a totally brilliant performance. I, I can watch it again and again and still find different layers and different levels of what Julian is up to. I, I, I did not want to interrupt you because watching that clip, I mean, you were watching like, like that, as if somehow you hadn't seen it before. It is always, it, 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 as I say, it's fantastically enriching, is that you, ought, you can still find layers and attitudes and um, responses that Julianne is doing every time you see the film. Congratulations. Thank you very much. It's an extraordinary film. Thank you. Back in a moment. Stay with us.